Okay, let's take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. I'm going to try to move it on here. And we have missions conference coming up. I want to kind of renew our thoughts and kind of get our mind going uh, in the direction of world missions. And we're in the book of Acts tonight. The Greek title, Proaxis, which means the Acts or the Acts of the Apostles. And so in this book, we actually have the history of the church. And, of course, missions, the mission of the church is missions. We're going to pick that up uh, really, really in a big way in Acts chapter 13. Uh, surrounding the church at Antioch. And we're the church at Franklin Road. We're the church in Murfreesboro, you might say. And uh, we have our, our local church job to do. We'll look at the local church tonight and what they did. And uh, most of this will not be new. It's be, pretty much be a reminder to us what our job will be the next several days. I hope you'll be praying about all that. Let's stand together, please. Read of God's Word, Acts chapter number 13. We'll read down through the first five, five verses, kind of get us started who some of the players are. And as we read these, of course, there's all kinds of spinoff messages that I've preached from this section. But I want us to read through this as, uh, t- tonight as really a historical c- account, what this church did. And we're going to see the success of that here in just a moment and kind of pull some thoughts out for our church. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucia, Lucius uh, of Cyrene and Manian and which had been brought up with the Herod with Herod the tetrarch and Saul and as they ministered to the Lord and fasted the Holy Ghost said separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them so we see Saul and Barnabas being called out of this church others were as well later When they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them, and they sent them away. So they, being sent by the Holy Ghost, departed to Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. Now we're seeing the start of the players here, um, and we're thankful and grateful for the life of these two men. If you'll turn over chapter 14, I'll read just a few verses there. Let's see how this ends up, or this stage or phase did. Look at verse 21. When they had preached the gospel, chapter 14, verse 21, and when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples. So they made a full circle. Well, not mention all the cities they went to. They made a full circle. They're coming back now to their church. Much of what Brother Haley did tonight, seven years ago, he left the States, he started the church, he came back, he reported, and uh, so they're making their rounds, and they're confirmed, verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, uh, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. When they had ordained them elders in every church and and had prayed uh, with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believe, that means that they set the churches up, they organize it, there's a whole lot more detail in other passages of Scripture. Um, Brother Haley can only come home uh, to the States because the church is established and organized and it's moving forward. He has men to stand in his place. And uh, so, verse number 24, and after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word to Perga, they went down to Attilia. And now they're making their rounds. They're making their way home now to Antioch. And since sailed to Antioch, from whence they had had been recommended. Uh, In other words, this is where they made their commission, their commitment to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. The other circle of the word fulfilled. This is the success of what they have done now. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode a long time with the disciples. I have written in my Bible a little word furlough, question mark. <laughs> so they got a little R and R. And how many understand that whenever... Uh, it's a culture shock to leave America and go to another country, especially uh, in, in the deep part of Africa, and to come home. And how many of you say a missionary deserves a break every now and then? And I don't know how long they stayed, not long, but these men reported. And I want to speak on this subject for just a while tonight, purpose and vision for world evangelism. And I'm going to be very, uh, I'm going to be very, very uh, uh, fast here, but I'm going to centralize on just some of the main points that we also be working on here as our church. Father, bless now as we talk about this subject. 
I pray you'll speak to our hearts. We really had a tremendous example of this uh, before our very eyes uh, tonight. I never even thought about the, the relationship here with Brother Haley and, and uh, what um, Brother Bowman does and, and Erica and Lord, many of our missionaries were so thankful and grateful for him. And um, we're looking forward to hearing the reports uh, from uh, Brother Angel on Sunday and then the new folks to hear their burden. It's, it's with great excitement we enter into this conference. I pray you'll set the stage for us tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. Sometimes I believe it becomes apparent that we need to remind ourselves the importance of worldwide missions. We, if we're not careful, we kind of get in a bubble. And we certainly should be reaching our area with the gospel. We have been emphasizing that. And, but the, the vital importance of a church focusing on the world, I cannot emphasize it enough. And especially during difficult times, if you could pull back the pages of history and look at how the church got started and how world missions began, all of that was done during very, very difficult times. And, and we're heading in, I believe, to, to difficult times here in America, but that should not stop our emphasis and our work on missions. We don't just draw in and, uh, and stop. So tonight I want to evaluate, I want to emphasize, I want to kind of elevate what we do and why we do it. We give a lot of money to missions and we probably ought to give more. And we, we, we emphasize that we probably should do so more. But I want us to look at this church uh, and the way that God used it. And I want us to have the right kind of vision and what we're trying to accomplish. This church, as well as every New Testament church, is under orders from our Heavenly Father to reach the world. Let me read just some, some familiar verses. Matthew 28, 18, we call it the Great Commission. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, go because of this power that's vested, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. You probably noticed in the, in the video or the, the slides just a moment ago, he got to a section where he was showing pictures of people, people being discipled, being taught how to teach Sunday school. He saw some deacons being ordained and different things going on. He was, he was doing the work of the same way with the thing we do right here, doing the work of the ministry in an area where it had never been done before. And so this was what the case with the Antioch church and the men that left there. And so, again, in Acts 1, 8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So uh, the commission uh, for this church is not just to Murfreesboro and Rutherford County and just America. We've got to be going simultaneously into all the world. And so we work hard at that, and we try to keep that in front of you, and there's a reason for that. Uh, first of all, the health of this church is dependent upon how well we obey this command. Now, I may get to this later. We'll have a brief business meeting. We'll throw some numbers up here for you to see how God has blessed us financially and, and, and how God has held our church together. And we'll say a word about that, what the Lord has done. But can I tell you this? I think the main reason he does that is because we focus on reaching the lost, not just in our city, but around the world. I just heard of a church just, uh, just today. I was talking to another pastor, and he was telling me uh, uh, the church was about 800 or so, and, and they, uh, eight or nine, very big, miss, big mission church. Probably if I named the church, some of you would know it. But uh, they would give uh, Brother Eric close to $900,000 a year to missions. Last year, they gave 90000 And they had dropped most of their missionaries. I'm talking about a church in a large city that's just gone backwards. And really, to be honest with you, the driving force in that was Reformed theology, Calvinism. And they saw that they, they lost their burden for the lost. And, and I, this, this pastor was, was not the pastor of the church. He was just informing me of it, was weeping over it. Let me just say, fo folks, a church can change on a dime if we're not careful. And when we lose our focus, I mean, now they're having a hard time paying their bills. Do you know that God looks down from heaven and he blesses a church for different reasons? And one of those reasons is because of worldwide missions. I learned that long ago in little West Virginia where I was hid away where no one knew who we were, or where we were. And I learned then that the more I did of getting out the gospel in my city of Ripley and around the world, that God would bless that. And he did. And so, and he will continue to do that. We understand that as a church without a clear vision, 
uh, uh, of our purpose, we tend toward disorder. And uh, after a while, we can lose complete focus. And when that happens, problems begin to occur in a church. And so soon factions will, will form. You say, well, how does that happen? Well, people, whenever you're not focused on the main thing, people start telling you what they think the main thing is. And you, and you just kind of just get all separated. Maybe they could say the main thing was the Christian school or the main thing, the sports program is the main thing is the nice buildings or the main thing is the music program. Or, and, and they just, look, look, the main thing is the Great Commission. We've got to stay focused on all of that. And so <clears throat> we... Uh, this is true in business. Uh, in order for you to have a, a, a good business, you must stay true to your purpose and the reason you exist. I don't care if you make shovel handles. The day that you decide that you're going to make, uh, make uh, uh, I don't know, your wife does macrame and you want to sell that on the side. Well, it's going to take away from making shovel handles. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I don't even know if you know what that is. I don't know that I know what macrame is. That came from somewhere there. Uh, it's the same is true in a marriage. Listen now, you must stay true to your purpose for forming that union. And that is uh, uh, for the glory of God and meeting each other's needs. And the day that you, you stray from that, you're going to have trouble in your marriage. Same is true of a nation. I would just say this, that America is headed toward chaos if we're not already in it and don't know it because we've left our foundational purpose of being one nation under God. I mean, our Constitution, all of our founding documents were, were made because of godly men that set this nation up. We're walking away from that. We can say, well, we've left the Constitution, or we've left the Declaration of Independence, we've left the amendments, we left the First Amendment. Left. No, 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 we walked away from God. That is the purpose. That's why these, those, those folks floated over here this nation to start with. One nation under God. And the same is true with the church. Our purpose properly understood and obeyed, stands as an anchor for this ministry. Don't ever forget that. Whenever we come to missions conference, I don't want you to come here and say, well, this is a nice, nice quaint little thing we have. We kind of, we've got tent meeting, missions conference. All that. No, no, no. Nothing compares to the missions conference. Nothing in my book because it, it, it fires us up about what our purpose is. And as long as we obey God in that matter of reaching the lost, locally, worldwide, I believe the gates of hell should not prevail against this church, this assembly of believers. May we never get unfocused. Now, with that said, let me give you four quick things. I want you to jot these down. And then I have, let me see right here, this last page. I got four more quick things to close. Okay, I can do this. I can do it. Here we go. Number one, number one, the church at Antioch here, a model church, notice these four things about their purpose and vision. Number one, they ministered to the Lord. They ministered to the Lord. And uh, back in chapter 13, it says, Now, there, uh, there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets uh, and teachers. Skip down, look at verse 2. What were they doing? As they ministered to the Lord. What does that mean? Well, it means an array of things. But the word minister means they were serving the Lord right there. Serving the Lord right there. This church, though we go into uh, the world, you and I should be serving the Lord right here. That's where it starts, right here. We don't, we don't pay our missionaries to do our work. We give to our missionaries and pray for our missionaries to raise up fruit to our account that God can rebound it back to us and give us the blessings and obedience to, to the Great Commission. But they ministered to the Lord. Everything they did, at, if we could call this First Baptist Church of Antioch, had to go through this litmus test, and that is this. Does the ministry have anything to do with the Lord? We could say like this. Does the ministry have anything to do with the gospel? Why does that ministry exist? Uh, this church at Antioch, it was loaded with gifted people. Uh, there was no time for self-serving ministries. Uh, they weren't to rally around a particular faction or group. They ministered to the Lord. The Lord is our focus. Uh, by the way, in our church, this is not my ministry. It is not your ministry. It is the Lord's ministry. And we're all in this thing together. Okay, get a little amen right there. Don't ever forget that. You may or may not get what you uh, get to do what you want to do around here. This may be breaking news. I'm the pastor, and I don't get to do everything that I think needs to be done around here. But by and by, I probably get more than you do. But anyway, uh, be honest. But but still, there's just there's just. If you could get in my office and get in all my to do lists and all my prayer lists and everything that I've got, I mean, when I read it, it wears me out just reading it. And just praying down my prayer list. And can I say that God wants us to do much more than we're doing. Not right now. 
And uh, we ought to pray about those things, but not get sidetracked on that which is not pleasing to the Lord. Please understand that most churches exist today to play, to entertain, to fellowship. I'm not opposed to, to, to fellowship. I'm not opposed to any of that. But what the New Testament church exists for today is to reach the world to the best of its ability, and we can't stop that. So it all focused around the Lord. They're having this big meeting. There's going to be a couple men called into the ministry, but they were serving the Lord first. Number two, write this down. They fervently prayed. <clears throat> they fervently prayed. Verse number two, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. Now, the word fasted, fasting has more to do when they're just, just, than just praying for your food, praying before you go to bed, praying your basic prayers for the day. Fasting is a type of fervent prayer where you give up food. Many times you'll give up rest. You'll give up a lot of things. But this church on this occasion came together because they saw a need. They were serving the Lord. They wanted to branch out. And they fasted and prayed for God to send workers into that. You and I are taught to pray the Lord of the harvest, <clears throat> that he send forth laborers in the harvest. And so because of that prayer meeting, they were able to discern the call of the Holy Spirit. Look at the verse. As they ministered to the Lord, verse 2, and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas, Barnabas and Saul, for the work <clears throat> whereunto I have called them. So they weren't mama called. They weren't pastor called. They were called of Almighty God. But they would have never have known, and that church would have never have been able to confirm that these men were called if they had not prayed and the Holy Spirit of God impressed upon everybody in that church. Yep, those men are called of God. What a, what a spectacular event that was. And so uh, they fasted at times as a church, and God showed them the way. This is so important in understanding what a church is supposed to do, not just with missions, but uh, do we build a building? Do we not build a building? Do we ordain a man to, to preach? Do we not do that? Do we start a ministry? Do we not? Do we host a meeting or not? We, we, can't, we just can't afford to shoot in the dark in these things. Now, we all, we're all prone to error. Uh, there are no apostles in this church. There are no prophets in this church. They're all dead. Can you get a little amen right there? So we're prone to err, but to the best of our ability, we should be a spirit-led church, and that comes with the more fervent our prayers are. And I'm thankful for, for, to God in heaven for those times that maybe we didn't get things quite right somewhere along the line. God showed grace, gave us the ability to get things twisted around where they needed to be, and I'm thankful for that. So as we consider this purpose and vision uh, of the church and of, of world missions, number one, this church ministered to the Lord. May we never stop doing that. Number two, they fervently prayed. May we do more of that. Number three, they sent out workers to the mission. They sent out workers to the mission. Uh, verse two, the last part, they, they uh, separated these two. Verse three, and when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them. They sent them away. I would suppose the, the last uh, uh, couple we sent out from here was Josh and Bethany Ferran. What a special service that was. We had a chance to, to work with Josh and see his abilities. We had the ability to see God call him. We had the ability to ordain him. We had the ability to, to send him out from this church. What a spectacular event that is for a church. What a special thing that is. Uh, to see our son ordained just not long ago. We're so thankful for all that. But we, we try to be led by the Spirit of God in all those. Right when this church was beginning to grow, it selected two of its best people for the mission field. Now, i got to be honest with you. It's hard for me to let Josh and Bethany go. They were some of our best employees here at this church. I'm so thankful for them. I miss them. But, oh, how they're, they're tearing it up. I think my wife was telling me, her Miss Ruth was talking the other day. They had, uh, what was it they had? Harvest. They had a harvest festival. wonder where they figured out how to do that harvest festival. <laughs> but in Ar Ireland, Ireland, <laughs> boy, West Virginia's coming out on me. In Ireland, they had, they had nearly 50 come to that. And I cannot tell you how big that was. That was huge for them. 
And uh, they were so excited about all that. I want to support that. I don't know about you. I can't go to church there, but I want to support that. And I want to pray for that. I, I'm pumped about this acreage, this man got. I'm excited about that. And, and I, I, I saw the tennis courts, but I also saw the big field there where you could put soccer fields and different things, for those, which is big down there. And uh, I, I'm just thankful. But, but we, we, we see the mission. We send out workers to that. And at a time when they could have used Paul and Barnabas there, you say, why? Why did they do that? Because this is the purpose of the church. And just as, as much as God is able to call good people out of your church, God is able to replace those people. Some churches fight this. Uh, they want to keep everybody home. Mamas and daddies want to keep everybody home. I get all that. They want to keep all their money at home. Why would we send $600,000 uh, overseas when we could use that here? I'm a good reason because God told us to. And it's just the right thing to do. You could say the same thing about your tithe that many Christians do. They can say, well, I can spend my tithe better than the church can spend it. Well, how's that working out for you? We miss the fact that it's, it's commanded. Oh, I got to hurry on. Okay. So, so uh, I got four more points after this last point. So this is the purpose of the church. A healthy church will regularly see this happen and uh, see young men called to preach, see young, young, young people go to Bible college and, 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 uh, and attract gifted men to raise up fruit to our account and we see families that surrender to go and church members rally to support them. And I want to see, I want to see our church rally this week. And you need to pray about this. We need to rally this week around these missionaries coming. We've got some great missionaries. You can pick up a copy, see their pictures back there. And so that's that. Number four, write this down. And I'm going to wind it down. Number four, write this down. Number four, notice they obeyed their purpose for existence. They, uh, the Antioch church was successful. <clears throat> Number four, the Antioch church was successful. Now I want you to look over again at chapter 14. Let's see how this worked out. So they went, they made this full big circle. And in verse number 26, they sailed back to Antioch. From whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled or completed. That means that was that leg of their journey. They went again several more times. Names changed. Players changed. But this is just the account of these men. Other men were later sent out. And most of the apostles uh, captured great areas uh, of the world for the Lord. And so this church was successful. Uh, the Bible says they came, in verse 27, to the church. They gathered the church together. They rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And so uh, the, I asked Brother Haley, how long are you going to be in? He's, he's get, they're getting ready to go back in December and they go back to the field where they long. They're, you may maybe notice they're going to get permanent residency there. And uh, I noticed they had their driver's license. I sure hope they can drive better there than they can drive here. Everybody here is a spoiled brat. No, everybody that's driving right now got an A on all their papers, and everybody got a trophy, and you see where that got us. No one has to stop at stoplights. Go figure it out. But they were successful, and they rehearsed that. They had a slide presentation is what they had. And uh, so now let me give you four quick things. When a church fully understands its purpose and vision, here's what it creates, I believe. Number one. It uh, provides direction for the church. We don't have to guess about what, what we're doing. We may not always be good at it, but we don't have to guess at it. Our job is to reach our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most part of the world. We're not shooting in the dark. Number two, and by the way, we can always come back to it when, we're, when we begin to, to, to appear to stray. Number two, it helps motivate the church. It helps motivate the church. Uh, I told you that story about a church that failed in this or in their process of failing. This pastor said, Brother Norris, would you pray that somebody will get in that church, a pastor, and revive that church? You all need to understand that the health of this church is more than for us to raise our kids in. The health of this church depends on missionaries worldwide. Nearly 200. That if we fail... 
and start pulling back support, it knocks a big hole in what they're trying to accomplish. This helps motivate us. There is a bigger reason for us to come together and to meet and to grow. And can you understand that the growth of our church is evidence of the Great Commission, but also the more people that attend here and get burdened here and get trained here and give here, the more we can do for missions. Number three, it generates enthusiasm. You be, I, I don't know about you, but it appears as though you all got pretty excited about the presentation. You applauded when he was done. I didn't have to get up and ask you to. You just, it, was just, it was just a sense of accomplishment. And you had a hand in that. And we want to have a greater hand in that. And so this conference coming up, I will tell you, if you'll come, there'll be a sense of enthusiasm. There'll be a sense of camaraderie. We've got people be coming in that we're going to get to know. They're going to send them back. We had the Knickerbockers in for just a while, and you all loved on them so much, it was hard for them to go back. That's a wonderful thing, that, that we can love on people like that. And, and when you, you bring your gift up, you say, well, I got out there and someone took all the gifts. Well, glory to God. Go get an Amazon card or go get a... a I don't know, Walmart or Costco or Sam's or whatever. And, uh, and, and bring it up. And they'll be playing that Christmas music. If I could figure out how to make snow, I'd make snow fall in here. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what to do to get you excited. Just launch you to the moon and back. I don't know. But, but missions conference is exciting. And uh, to hear the reports. And then lastly, I think it brings the best out in our church. We just kind of rise to the occasion. Lord willing, by Wednesday night, we'll reach the mark. If we don't reach the mark, we'll reach it by Sunday. But, um, man, let's be praying right now what God would have us do. When our missionaries come in, you feel a part of their life. And just begin to recognize uh, and uh, use our gifts and talents for the Lord. Now, let me close. I intentionally ran through this. Purpose and vision is all that we need to grow and obey God. Just purpose and vision. The Antioch Church did not have any mission agencies, boards. They had no publications, no printing presses, no computers, no radios, no TVs. They just understood what God wanted them to do. And they did it. And they did it very successfully. Standing.